It's after midnight. I wanted this video done days ago. I don't know why I keep doing this to myself. I don't want to do one for March. Anyway, so let's talk about what movies I saw this month. Uh, February. Last month? At this moment? Jackass Forever is the fourth and likely final entry, for Knoxville's sake, of the Jackass film franchise. It's about a bunch of middle-aged men and a few younger newcomers mutilating their genitals live on camera and somehow getting it out to over 3,000 theaters nationwide. They've been doing this thing for 22 years at this point, so some of them will be more susceptible to injuries than others. Okay, I'm not gonna be around the bush here. I love Jackass. I have a box set of their show, and I love all their movies. Well, Bad Grandpa was okay, but the others are pure cinema. Mwah. And I also love how the majority of critics are beginning to pick up on this as well. We've gone through such a cultural shift in these last few decades that what was once derided as lowest common denominator entertainment is now an indisputable work of comedic art. What makes it really funny is that all these films are largely the same. There's no plot, no stakes, no narrative, just a bunch of segments where they injure themselves or prank each other or do something deliberately juvenile. Their main objective is to entertain and make you laugh, and I find that to be kind of special. But the true thing that really makes Jackass Jackass is its cast. For all these scenarios, all these stunts, you don't laugh at their pain, but with them. Within every injury, there's surprising camaraderie. Whenever somebody gets themselves hurt doing a typically stupid thing, not only do all the spectators laugh, but the victim themselves gets up and laughs too, cause hey, they put themselves up for it. Granted, not all the time, but when you're on the set, you kinda have to know what you're in for. Or you'd have your head shaven and shit. It makes you feel like you're part of this silly, tight-knit group, while luckily not actually being a part of it. And in this film, it's no different, while at the same time, kinda being so. In terms of the cast, you have all the returning jackasses, well, with one exception. Along with some new blood, literally and figuratively. Johnny Knoxville and Steve-O are back for the confirmed final time due to their age, which is thankful, cause they do get pretty f***ed up in this. The former especially. That one scene in the trailer, where that bull rams right into him, that's followed up with him on the ground for what was clearly edited down, but for likely minutes, completely unconscious until he wakes up and is taken to the hospital. And he's taken to the hospital again on another minor skit as well, and yeah, he still cracks jokes afterwards, but something about it feels inherently worrying. It's sort of like watching your dad get injured. He's just gotten too old to really enjoy his suffering, so I don't blame him for not participating much in the movie. It is interesting seeing his hair dye appear and disappear throughout. Steve-O doesn't come out of it a lot better either. There's this one segment where they basically reenact a Family Guy joke, and who boy, that was some edge of your seat entertainment. The other guys are back and as ready to die as ever, with Preston, Lacey, and Wee Man still game on using their unique physicality for various embarrassments, and Chris Pontius doing things with his crotch that I still can't unsee. Dave England, unfortunately, doesn't poop on anything, at least not up close. And Danger Aaron, oh my god, this poor man. He is in a lot of the movie and gets so fucking abused in it, good lord. I get why he certainly has some of the funny reactions to things, but I wonder if he feels anything down there anymore. You know? The new cast members were all very fun, with the particular standouts being Zach Holmes, who really fits into this group like a glove, and Rachel Wolfson, who wasn't in as many of the skits but definitely makes a strong impression. One of the other newcomers brought their dad along in a few of the skits and he was a very fun presence. There are several other guest stars who drop by, like Machine Gun Kelly, Tyler the Creator, and Eric Andre, who was in more of the movie than I expected him to be, even falling victim to one of the pranks. He does feel like he belongs though. And to address the skateboarding elephant in the room, Bam Margera is not in the movie. Apart from one very brief cameo that I had to look up afterwards to even know he was in. He's not present for reasons such as failing his drug tests as well as being a mess of a person, and I genuinely feel bad for him. He's really gone up the deep end, especially after the passing of his best friend and fellow jackass Ryan Dunn. It's sad to see what's become of him. I hope he gets the help he needs. But in all honesty, while I did get amusement from stuff Bam did in the show, his absence didn't feel that noticeable. He may make up a part of Jackass, but having them gone doesn't throw everything off balance. If Steve-O or Chris Pontius or Wee Man weren't here, that would have been way more distracting, but as I said, it's for the best Bam's not in this anyway. Other than that, there's not a whole lot to say. It's a fun time. 
definitely not for the squeamish. They do a few skits where they misdirect the victims into where they think it's going that were fun. There may have been a bit too many dick and crotch related ones, which is standard, but it could have probably used a bit more variety. The climax also came a little suddenly, and I'm not just saying that because I was sad it was over, but it started off like a regular skit until it got a little bigger and just became the ending. Granted, I could be critiquing it because absolutely nothing will top the ending of number two, where they put on a damn musical number. Jackass is forever. If you're mentally prepared and are in the mood to laugh a lot and feel nauseated, then it is playing at a multiplex near you. Kimmy is the latest thing Steven Soderbergh just did while we had our backs turned for a second. It stars Zoe Kravitz as an agrophobic tech worker of a Siri-like app who happens to hear something she shouldn't have and now the feds are on her tail. Soderbergh makes a lot of movies. Some of them I like. Others I'm kinda eh on. I have to really be in a specific mood to watch one cause I'm never sure what I'm gonna get out of it. I only watched this cause it was on the front page when I booted up Max and it was 89 minutes long. I figured why not and I watched it and I thought, alright, that was fun. It's a simple little rear window-esque thriller set in the modern age and by that I mean during the COVID pandemic. She walks around a public area where about 50% of people there are wearing masks. This is the first time in a long time I saw a recent movie where I go, hey, this feels realistic. This is not some magical fantasy world where Evan Hansen sings to a crowd full of super spreaders. But having said that, I am fine with keeping reality out of my entertainment, especially if they're not particularly adept at discussing such a topic. On a related note, Jackass Forever might be the first movie I saw in theaters to have people wearing masks in it, which felt a little strange that way. What's interesting though is that while the pandemic plays into the story, it doesn't encompass it either. If anything, it's there to make the protagonist's agoraphobia even more justified, but the film still manages to tell an entertaining chase em up. If anything, having COVID in the background makes any event infinitely more stressful, like going to the store or doing anything outside. It's a very competently made film with lots of nice editing and Dutch angles. It's like this guy's a good filmmaker or something. Zoe Kravitz is also really good as the lead. This seems to be shaping up to be a big year for her if Batman's any indication. The writing itself is a bit of a mixed bag. It's from David Coep, a well-known Hollywood screenwriter with a track record that's inconsistent to say the least. I felt some of the dialogue and interaction sounded a wee bit unnatural, like uh ho ho, this Russian tech guy is a pervert. Stuff like that made the first act a little sloggy for me. Once she leaves the apartment and the action starts, it begins to pick up, even if there are still certain elements that I felt were underdeveloped, like this neighbor character who kind of randomly appears at a crucial point and helps out for no adequately explained reason. The ending itself was pretty satisfying, although that freeze frame was kind of pushing it. It's a decent, simple, entertaining enough thing. If you have HBO Max and are in the mood for something short and watchable, this is likely one of the better options. The Worst Person in the World is a Norwegian romantic dramedy about a woman stumbling into the world of relationships while being very indecisive about what trajectory to take her life in, especially at the ripe age of 30. You ever do something that you like doing thinking you could make a career out of that thing, only to either get bored after a little while, or find that your talent lies for something else and choose to pursue that on a whim? I am like that. I would think about what I want to accomplish and wonder, why haven't I accomplished that yet? I'm pretty sure I have some sort of ADD, but that's beside the point. What is the point is that your life is fleeting even when you don't think about it. You can never guess where it's going or who you'll end up with. The main character in this believes to have found happiness with someone, but does she really? Maybe she likes that guy she met at the party the other night. Should she cheat? I mean, apart from being pretty ethically wrong, that party guy isn't like her boyfriend who created a Fritz the Cat-like underground comic in the 21st century. I mean, I think that's worthy of some respect. He does seem a little more put together than Robert Crumb, but sometimes you just have to freeze the world and follow your heart. The way I'm describing this sounds like it went from a philosophical musing of mortality to a whimsical romantic comedy, and that's because it kinda is both those things. Maybe not in that order, nor that black and white. It's a movie that can make you giggle at one minute and feel depressed the next. It's a film that has scenes that are fantastical and silly, but also real and hard-hitting. When I was describing this movie to my dad, he pointed out that Norwegian cinema seems to have a fascination with death and mortality, if Igmar Bergman is anything to go by. 
I mean, I likely shouldn't generalize an entire nation's pop culture unless they appear in my cinema, hanging around playing Battleship and Twister. I don't know what trajectory this review is going other than to say, I really love this movie. I may have not gone through the same experiences as the character, I'm not a 30-year-old woman who is on the fence about starting a family, but it did strike a very personal chord with me. This is certainly one that I am going to be thinking about for a while. So if you like good movies, go see this film. It is now playing in whatever art house theater is closest to your area, if there are any. It's worth it at least to learn about not the worst person in the world, but rather the world's most iconic butthole. That statement will make sense once you see it, trust me. Big Bug is a new science fiction comedy satire thingy from Jean-Pierre Jeannet, the director of Amelie, Delicatessen, and The City of Lost Children. It's set several decades in the future where society has relied on the help of robotic maids and assistants. A family and a few other people get locked into their house due to an uprising among androids, and nobody's allowed to leave without speaking to the government's scary robocops. The ACs are turned off and every human in the house progressively becomes more hot and horny, while their personal robots convene to make their detainment more comforting. Wane makes some good movies from what I've seen. His style is certainly unique and his work runs the gamut between very twee and rancid. This is his first film in a while and it quietly dropped on Netflix, a service he once stated he would only go to if he had absolutely no other option for distribution. Fancy that. I turned it on knowing practically nothing about it other than its director, the fact that it's set in the future, and that it's gotten quite the mixed response from people. And having now seen it, I kinda get it. I don't think it's a bad movie, in fact I sorta had fun in a lot of scenes, but there is quite a bit holding it back as well. I was surprised to find that this was going to be a feature length bottle episode where every character is in one location for the whole duration. It makes it clear that it was a COVID production, but I like these kind of stories. The tone is very cartoonish and over the top, possibly more so than Wane's other stuff, where everyone has a very basic characterization and goal, like main lady likes stuff from the past and is lonely. Teenage boy is moody. Old man is horny for the lady. Ex-husband is materialistic. The secretary that the ex-husband is banging is a pain in the ass. The maid robot is confused over proper human etiquette. The list goes on like that. But you know, I don't really have a problem with that. I'm fine with goofy, fairly unlikable characters in a wacky comedy as long as it's consistently funny. And it sorta isn't? Well, the first half of the movie does play up the kind of silliness a premise like this should be going for. As it goes on, it starts taking a slightly more serious approach, which I didn't feel worked, and it starts making the lack of depth on everyone more of an issue than it was initially. Like, now I have to start caring about these people. It's here also where the structure starts to get pretty repetitive, where characters would go, I have a plan to escape from here, only for it to backfire. This happens several times, almost in a row, not helping that this is way too long, running almost two hours. I feel that's really what hurts the simplicity it's trying to go for. And that doesn't just boil down to its writing either. The things that it's trying to say about technology is so basic and old hat, don't rely on it too much, least of all the robots will break on you, or try to kill you. Again, I don't inherently have an issue with this, as it's meant to be a simple comedy, but I can't help but wonder if he is trying to go for any bigger messages than that. There's an idiocracy type show that involves treating humans like animals that they keep bringing up seeming to imply that humans are viewed as a lower class species or something. They don't go that deep in addressing that. Maybe he's trying to go for some sort of Jacques Tati approach of playfully pointing out how ridiculous our obsession with modernity is, and that the old ways are far more practical and comforting. Maybe I'm projecting too much, I don't know. On the technical side of things, it's interesting. I mean, go figure. His direction for the most part is solid enough as usual. He moves the camera with a certain precision. He frames shots in his well-renowned, deranged way. He casts interesting-looking people that he'll use for close-ups. That's all fairly solid. What's left is the art design, which is meant to look deliberately kitschy and artificial, which is fine for the sets, it does give the film a distinctive color palette, but for other elements, like the CG especially, look pretty bad at points. It reminds me a lot of Robert Rodriguez's family films, or some of the lesser shots in Speed Racer, it just doesn't look quite right. The more practical looking effects, particularly with the family's robots, are actually pretty decent. I also found the editing pretty frustrating at points, so many scenes would just end with a fade to black very suddenly and fade into the next one. It doesn't help make the film feel any less repetitive. 
I know I'm sounding pretty critical of this, many of which are things I'm thinking back to in hindsight, but honestly, I don't think it's a bad movie. In fact, the negative reception towards it I feel is pretty undeserved. I was amused fairly often, and it at least kept me interested enough to see it through. I just wish it sort of quit while it was ahead or something. If anything, this at least feels like something a talented director wanted to make, even if it doesn't hold a candle to his other works. So if this still somewhat interests you, then erase this review from your memory and check it out on Netflix. You may like it or not. Regardless, robots, man. The future. Strawberry Mansion is a fantasy set in the not-too-distant future where people are charged for dreaming, and one auditor visits the house of a lonely old lady and browses through her dream collection where he starts to fall in love with her and learns the truth about his own dreams. I never heard of this movie before, but I kept seeing its trailer play at my local art house theater, so I decided to give it a watch because it looked interesting. And yeah, it was. It is a very creative and original movie that was not made by any big studio or is based on any pre-existing intellectual property. We need more of these. You could also tell it wasn't made with the biggest budget, but in this case it's actually for its benefit. The visual design of this movie, with its obvious puppets and clunky stop motion, could be best described as a school play aesthetic. The homemade feel makes it feel very personal, and the grainy texture really gives off an appropriately dreamy feel. I genuinely can't tell if they shot it on film or shot digitally and made it look grainy in post. Whichever it is, there is a lot of thought put into how it looks, and I'm sure they put a similar level of thought into its screenplay as well. Unfortunately though, it's not as fun to follow. I love the concept of it, as well as some of the subtle world building for this Orwellian future, but I had kind of a hard time taking the story seriously. I didn't really believe the relationship between the main guy and the old lady. I don't know why he fell in love with her. I found the main emotional beat of the movie not working for me. There are some humorous moments every now and again. A lot of it being very awkward in tone, kind of Tim and eric -y, which I do like. But they're fairly far between, and it doesn't help that the pacing of the movie feels rather sluggish. It probably could have used some tighter editing and maybe another script draft. It reminds me a lot of this other film called Dave Made a Maze, which I also didn't love, but I do highly respect the creativity and imagination the filmmakers were going for. I would love for more adult films to just be kind of bug nuts and crazy, and if anything, these are both steps in the right direction for that. While I may have some issues with it, I do recommend going to see Strawberry Mansion anyway. It's too weird and unique to really cast aside. And if you're still not entirely convinced, consider this. A frog playing a saxophone. Like, come on, who wouldn't want to see that? The Texas Trans Rights Massacre is the fourth or fifth direct sequel to this pathetic franchise who second guesses how they want their sequel to follow up more often than Terminator 2. We follow quite possibly the least likable group of murder victims I've encountered in horror for a good while who are heading to an abandoned Texas town with the intention of gentrifying the area. But when they cross paths and piss off Leatherface, who boy, there'd be trouble in town tonight. And meanwhile, the girl who survived the original massacre, the character, not the actress, hears of Leatherface's return and goes off to kill him herself. So, the final girl of a horror movie grows to become a hardened old woman who spent several decades preparing to face off against the person who killed her friends and ruined her life. Something about that sounds a bit familiar to me, I don't exactly know what. Anyway, this movie is dog shit and unnecessary. I haven't seen every movie in the TCM, as I'd call it, Turner Classic Movies franchise, but like, do I really need to? Why did this have to be one? I mean, I know why, but there is literally nothing to do with it. Every sequel tried to recapture its grungy spirit but failed to do so. And hell, arguably the only good sequel didn't even try to do that. And this one is no different. Only now we follow millennials who TikTok about how Leatherface is gonna get cancelled if he tries to kill them. Try anything and you're cancelled, bro. It seems like the movie wants us to care about these young entrepreneurs that we follow, but like I said earlier, they are horrible people. The first scene shows them being rude to someone with little prompting. And then they instigate the titular massacre by doing something very stupid. On top of that, they all just behave like assholes, and I'd care very little for them if they die. Like, say what you will about Franklin from the original, he could be a pain in the ass at times, but I at least felt something when he was gone. The one least worst person in the world in this movie 
is the main girl, who we learn was the only survivor of a school shooting. A very heavy event that would strongly affect anybody. But don't worry though, cause, spoiler alert right now if you care, she gets over it by picking up a gun and shooting Leatherface. Yep, that's how you deal with trauma, alright. And speaking of trauma therapy, the Halloween subplot with the old lady is not only a painfully obvious ripoff, but also relates very little to the main story itself. It isn't about generational trauma, that really isn't a theme that it's trying to go for. It makes little sense for this girl to grow into an ass-kicking hermit. What is she expecting Leatherface to hibernate for a few decades? And her scenes feel like a whole different movie, because it is. And like that scene where she starts listing off the names of her dead friends to him, as if she expects him to remember? So f***ing stupid. I have a big issue with Leatherface as well, they're trying to make him into this lone wolf character, similar to Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees, someone who lurks around and kills people. Maybe from a studio executive's perspective I can understand that, as he is an iconic horror person, but going off what was established in what I consider the canon films, one of them even being released by canon, the thing that motivates Leatherface's actions most of all is family. Where is his family? We see one member early on, but she doesn't do much and is gone pretty quick. Where's the hitchhiker? Where's Drayton? Where's Chop Top? Where's Grandpa? I'm sure he'd still be alive by now. The whole family angle is what makes Leatherface interesting. Now he's just a big old goof wearing a mask and killing. And like... We already have enough of those. We had enough of these films as well. There's nothing new to offer. This doesn't say or do anything unique. I don't like the direction of it. Remember how the first was so gritty and visceral? It looked like some snuff film you'd find near a dumpster. This looks too clean and Netflix-y. It's also super gory, which is another notable contrast as the original Massacre was fairly light on the actual violence but made up for it in its atmosphere and the disturbing visuals. Now it's just blood spewing out in Carnage, which in a hypocritical way might be one of its few saving graces, it's got some gnarly kills and decent gore effects that a junkie horror flick needs to satisfy with. That, and also it is mercifully short, it clocks out at around 70 minutes or so, and even then you don't need to waste any time on this. Watch the first one, it's a genuinely effective horror, and the first second one is pretty fun in its own right, but after that, stop. Let the leather man rest with his family, you don't need any more from him. Go bother Jason again or something. I'm done. <laughs>